Hello everyone, this is Bob and Threadbear, and welcome back to The Longest Journey. That's the wrong menu. Okay. All caught up on April's diary, so... Now that the Gribbler's dead, it is time to celebrate... April! With a Bantu. I'm so glad you could come to our village and sit by our fire so we can thank you in the proper manner. It's my privilege, Ben Bandu. I wouldn't want to pass through this forest without visiting your village and seeing for myself how the Banda people live. Oh my, you speak so eloquently. My brother sits by the fire. I know he wishes to speak with you, but the elder would speak with you first. He rests in his hammock up on the mound. Go speak with him, and then come down again, so we can celebrate the death of the Gribbler and the brave escape of April Ryan and Ben Bondu's brother. Glowing. It's the elder Bondu. He got a nice bonfire built. It's Ben Bondu's brother, Bondu Uta. It's Crow. When did he get here? It's a hammock built for a Bondu. I should speak with the Elder first. I don't want to seem disrespectful. Looks like a pretty cozy hammock, too. The hero of the day comes to visit the old Bandu. Let me see your face, human. Make yourself shorter. That's much better. The human is closer to the soil now. And she may even feel it like we do. Moving, shaping itself, breathing, beating. I don't feel anything. Sorry. So the human is not a digger. But we don't judge her because of that. The human is a hero, she is. Don't call me that. I'm not a hero. I was just in the right place at the right time to help somebody out. She destroyed the evil that haunted our forest, and rescued one of our little ones from the creatures of chaos. And so she is a hero. She's the one spoken of in our songs, is she not? The one who will deliver us from an evil presence, and who will go on to save the balance. You are she, are you not? I don't know. Well, we will see, we will see. You will sleep in our spirit dig tonight, and then tomorrow, we will see. But now, you must enjoy yourself. This feast is in your honor to show our appreciation for your courage. Thank you. Go, eat, and drink, and dance, and then go to sleep in the spirit dig. We will talk tomorrow, before you continue your journey. You are on a journey, are you not? A very long one, yeah. We are all on a journey, but yours is the most important one ever. So go, I will smoke my pipe and think on prophecies and songs. Go. One might say it's the longest journey. <laughs> Crow? Oh, hey, uh, I was uh, wondering what happened to you. What happened to you? I thought you were supposed to help out in the search. I could have used some assistance this afternoon. Uh, yeah, but I did find some mal... Some banda, didn't I? Just not the one we were looking for is all. And besides, I was beat! My wings can only carry me so far before I need a twig to rest on and a couple of juicy berries. Speaking of berries, did you taste the ones they got here? The word is yum. Big yum. I don't know what they soaked them in, but hoo-hoo, man! Well, at least you're okay. No, oh, sure, you know me. I could use a good flea plucking, though. Care to reward me for my diligence? Diligence? Ha! Ah! <sighs> I'm guessing I'll be plucking my own fleas tonight, then, and, and I'm okay with that. I'm blaming you if I wake up with a crick in the neck tomorrow, though. Oh, 
dear. It's April. Sit. Sit down. Are you feeling all right? I thought you disappeared on me back at the Gribbler's lair. Oh, dear. I do apologize. I saw the Gribbler return from the forest, so I ran into the bushes and headed straight for the village. I was going to get help, you understand, but then I bumped into my brother, and I told him what was happening. Well, I'm glad you're okay. Thanks to you, April. How did you kill the Gribbler? Lots of luck and a little bit of quick thinking. My limited talents in the martial arts were woefully underused. Were you frightened? I don't think I've ever been so frightened in my entire life. Kind of exhilarating, actually. Although at this point, I think I've had quite enough excitement for a lifetime. Oh, dear me. I could never be as brave as you, April. Ever. What is the spirit dig the Elder told me about? Oh, it's a sacred place. A very sacred place. It's where we, the Banda, can speak with our ancestors, ask them questions, and learn from their wisdom. Yeah? Well, the Elder said I was to sleep there tonight. He did? The Elder said that? Then you have been honored by him, April. Only those worthy of the spirits of our ancestors can spend the night in the spirit dig. Where is the spirit dig? Right behind you, at the far end of our green. Enjoy the party, guys. Oh, but it's in your honor, April. You must enjoy it yourself, too. Well, apparently she's not very interested in enjoying the party because the only option I have here is to enter the spirit dig. There are tunnels extending down into the earth behind the screen. Mushrooms or chairs or both. It's not a big fire, but it's comfortably warm in here, and the smoke has a very pleasant, very mellow texture to it. It's some kind of bed made with twigs and moss. Not as comfortable as a real mattress, I'm sure, but it'll do. I'll just lie down for a few. No, screw that. I'm getting a good night's sleep. That's what I'm doing. I've never been this tired in my life. Yeah, that's fair. Sounds like the fire's drugged. But hey, this is the plane of magic, so... Just being drugged doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that it's not going to be a real vision. What the hell do you think you're doing? Wh what What are you doing here, you arrogant bitch? You don't think you can really save the world, do you? Who are you? I don't tell me you don't recognize me, April Ryan. I'm you. That's impossible. This is just another dream. I must be dreaming. Think again, loser. This is as real as it gets. Why are you here? I'm sending you home, that's what. You're a sad little twit. Don't you realize that? There's no point subjecting the entire world, hit two worlds, to your feeble attempts at redeeming yourself, is there? Go away! Leave me alone! How the hell am I supposed to do that, Einstein? I am you. You are me. Unfortunately for the both of us, we're inseparable. I don't need this Freudian id crap. Not now. There's so much I have to do, so many people I have to help. Oh yeah? Like you really believe that? Like you give a shit about those people? You're doing this for yourself, April, and that's why you're gonna fail. Shut up! Shut up! That's always your way out, isn't it? Telling people to shut up when they speak the truth and shutting them out when they're getting too close for comfort. Hey, 
Don't tell me. I do it because Daddy hurt me. Screw that. How do you think you're gonna hold up when this job gets tough if you can't rely on anybody or believe in anything? I'm doing it, aren't I? Yeah, because what kind of choice did you have? Face your problems back home? Face the nightmares? I don't think so. So you run. And you think you're putting distance between yourself and your fear of the past and the present? All you're doing is running straight into an inevitable nervous breakdown. Like right now. You're talking to yourself, April. Now that's not something a mentally stable person would do, is it? Shut up! Shut up! Shh. It's okay, April. It's okay. Charlie? Charlie, is that you? Shh. Don't you worry. I'm here. I'll take good care of you. Oh, God, Charlie. I'm so glad that... that you're... You're... You're not here. You can't be. I'm still dreaming. No, no. You're not dreaming. I'm here, but in spirit only. Is it? Is it really you, Charlie? We are Charlie, your friend. We feel his heart and his mind. And his sleeping spirit joins us. But we speak from the great digs of the beyond, where the songs of the banda never end. Are they dead? We have passed into the soil. We are spirits. And we have come to guide you. Why, Charlie? Why do you show me Charlie? He loves you. And so he guides us here. Into your heart and mind. He loves me? Charlie loves me? You are not alone in the world, April. There are many who care for you. Your friends and your family. Your real family. You are not alone in your journey through life. What do you know about my family? My real family? They watch out for you, April. That's all we know. They have never abandoned you. They have just let you live the life you needed to live. To understand. It's important that you understand. Understand what? That life, even when difficult and painful, is a gift. That love is priceless and rare and precious. That every good action, every good thought counts. And that a single person can make a difference, can change the world. If she puts her mind to it, if she believes in herself, and the people who believe in her. But everything is so frightening. I don't understand half of what goes on around me. Did not the mother say she would help you? Watch out for you? Did not Charlie and Emma, your friends, offer to give you a helping hand when you didn't even tell them the truth about what was going on? And Cortez the Red, did he not prove himself a friend as well? How then can you be so afraid when you have so many spirits to be with you in your darkest hour? Cortez the Red, please tell me what I have to do. I'm just fumbling in the dark here. Follow your heart and your spirit, April, and use your mind. These are your weapons, and with them you will defeat chaos. When you wake, tell the Elder that you've had a Bach bar, that you've spoken with the band of spirits, and that your name amongst our people is now April Bandu and Bata, April Digger who will seek and find. Oh, don't go, please don't go. Thump. All right, up to chapter five. Not going to break the video just yet. Got a little talking to do before that happens. That heartbeat thump is gone now.
People seem surprised by the thought that Charlie loves her. Oh, she's awake. April! Figured she was keeping him at arm's length on purpose. Good morning, Ben Bondu. Greetings of the new day to you, April. Did you sleep well in the spirit, Dig? Did I sleep well? Aside from the voices, the apparitions, the sharp rocks poking me in the back, and the moist moss mattress? No, not really. So you were visited by the spirits? I guess. When you told me last night that I would be, I didn't believe you. I thought it was just a manner of speaking, like saying, don't let the bed bugs bite. Our ancestors are close to us at all times. Once in a while, they speak to those who have been chosen to spend a night in the spirit dig. That they spoke to you is a great honor. April, a great honor. Right now, I'd be happy to exchange all the honor in the world for one decent night's sleep. <laughs> oh dear me, you are very funny, April. If all humans are as funny as you, your cities must be filled with laughter. The Elder wishes to speak with you again. And I must sing now, down in the tunnels. It was decided this morning that I was finally ready to join the diggers. I'm happy for you, Ben Bondu. Thank you. May the balance provide you on your journey, April. You will be in my heart always. And you will be in mine, Ben Bondu. Always. You will come back when your journey is over. I'll try. Goodbye. Oh, my. I cannot stand farewells. But... Farewell. Oh. Well, let's talk to the Elder. So, you are awake? Did you sleep well? As well as can be expected, I guess. Does the word Buckbar mean anything to you? Buckbar? Where did you hear this word? The spirits told me that I'd had a Buckbar. So the spirits spoke to you openly? You are lucky, human. Some who enter the spirit dig never come out again. And some spend the night but hear nothing. But to you, the spirits spoke. A Bakbar is a vision of yourself that speaks the truth in two ways. One is the dark truth. This is how you see yourself when you are not sure of yourself or angry with yourself. The other truth is the very opposite of the first. This is how you must see yourself to be happy. But the spirits remind us that both are important. That you cannot love yourself without first seeing your flaws. The people I saw, were they really there? The spirits use masks to convey their messages. And they speak in voices from the past or the present that carry great weight with you. The messengers are never the same, nor the message. But you must take care to hear and heed their words. I was told that my name among the Banda would be April Bandu Mbata. She among the little ones who seeks and finds. So, you are the one we sing of. The human who would come to aid us and to save our world, and who will then tear it apart. You bring tidings both happy and sad to the Banda, April Bandu and Bata, both hope and despair. This world will never be the same again once you have passed through it. But we are grateful, and I'm proud to have met you and to give you what you came for. It was just luck that brought me here. I didn't come for anything in specific. Yes, you did. This is what you came for. What is it? This is the stone given to us by the fathers to keep safe until this day. It has been with us for so long. 
Oh, it's a piece of the disc. Then you know it. You came for the stone, even though you didn't know it until now? I guess I did. Thanks. Now, you must continue your journey, April Bandu and Pata. Remember that this is your tribe now. And so you are welcome at our fires and in our digs whenever you come this way again. I'm honored. Thank you. May there always be soil between your toes, April Bandu and Pata. And between yours, Elder. Goodbye. He's sleeping. Wake up! Huh? Turn off the big light, Mommy. It's called the sun, Crow. Welcome to the world of the living. Oh. <sighs> I was having this weird dream about a big-ass turkey wearing a pair of red shoes. And you were there. And, and he was there. And, and, and maybe it wasn't a dream after all. I think it's safe to say that you need therapy, and we need to leave right now. We do? We do! Let's go get him! <clears throat> uh, who are we getting again? Some evil alchemist out to rule the world with his powerful and destructive magic. Yes! Exactly! Uh, I'll keep an eye out for other potential threats then, shall I? Like, uh, marauding mice? You do that, Crow. Thank you. All right, well, that's everyone now. So just check the diary one last time. And got the first stone. It's a piece of the stone disc I got from the Banda people. So it is. But we'll see the rest of the world next time. Today, we'll be looking at a classic novel written by one of the greatest authors who ever lived. Patron Radatosk has asked for The Left Hand of Darkness, published by Ursula K. Le Guin in 1969. About the author Ursula K. Le Guin was born in 1929, the daughter of an anthropologist and a writer. Thanks to her parents' professions and their remarkable permissiveness for the era, Le Guin grew up surrounded by academics, scientists, authors, and Native Americans. She attended Radcliffe College, the all-woman alternative to the all-men Harvard College, and she got a master's degree by studying Renaissance French and Italian literature. In 1953, Ursula began her doctorate studies by traveling to France, but on the way there, she met her future husband Charles Le Guin and chose to abandon her doctorate and marry him instead. This was apparently a good call on her part, because the two would remain married until her death in early 2018. Le Guin's writing career technically began when she was 11 years old and submitted her first story. And throughout the 1950s, she wrote five novels but couldn't get any of them published, apparently because of inaccessibility. The genre fiction ghetto may have had something to do with it, but I can only speculate. Either way, in the 1960s, she would start to get regularly published, and towards the end of the decade, she created the Earthsea setting, which includes six books and several short stories. The 1960s is also the decade in which she created the Hainish Cycle. This is a science fiction setting in which travel between solar systems is less than light speed, but communication between planets can be instantaneous thanks to a device called the Ansible. In ancient times, the human species evolved on the planet Hain, and then they colonized nearby planets, including Earth. Colonization and communication then ended for some reason, and in the present of the novel series, Hain has started sending ambassadors and ansibles to restore communications and induct planets into a peaceful confederacy. Since space travel is so slow and expensive, planetary invasions are both rare and highly impractical. With that all being said, the interstellar story of the Hainish cycle is most often in the background. 
It's used as an excuse to have an outsider protagonist explore the politics and unusual characteristics of a planet. And along with normal genetic divergence, it turns out that the ancient Hainish people also sent out colonies of genetic experiments. This fact is very much in play in the Left Hand of Darkness. So how about I get on with it and discuss... The story. I've already mentioned the setting background, so let me start with the novel's background. The protagonist, Genli Ai, is a visitor from Terra, from Earth, and he's an official envoy from the Ecumen, the society of planets that share knowledge and philosophies using ansibles. Genli's job is to formally make contact with the planet Gethen's civilizations and invite them to join the Ecumen. If they say no, then he'll leave and come back 30 years later, but if they say yes, then a few more Ecumen envoys who are in cryosleep in an orbiting vessel will come down to join him. For now though, Genli is alone and unarmed, so that he's as unthreatening as possible. However, Genli is not the first Ecumen visitor to Gethen. They earlier sent an investigation team who learned the planet's customs, languages, and other important details. Chief among those details, in this case, is the fact that Gethenian humans have no separate sexes. For 24 days out of every 26, Gethenians have no sexual urges and underdeveloped sexual attributes. But for those last two days, they go into kemmer, into heat, basically, and they develop male or female sexual organs, basically at random. There are a couple of exceptions. Staying close to someone in Kemmer can make someone develop the opposite sexual organs, so marriage exists, but it's not as big a deal, and both partners can be mother and father to their children. That said, the book uses male pronouns for everyone, but that's strictly because of the limitations of the English language and the fact that the man, Genli, is the book's narrator. Then there's the political situation on Gethen. The planet is just coming out of a long ice age, and as such there are only two major nations on Gethen, even though the technology is roughly on par with early 20th century Earth. There are also only two nations, because Gethenians don't really go to war. They'll commit every other tragedy and atrocity known to humankind, but it's only recently that the two major nations have had the ability to go to war, thanks to the frozen climate. The two nations on Gethen are Karhide and Orgore, and Genli chooses to land in Karhide's territory. Karhide is ruled by a king, but the king is widely considered insane by his own people and even his own chancellors. This includes Estraven, Karhide's prime minister and the person who helped defend and promote Genli's cause since he arrived two years ago. However, soon after the book begins, Estraven is exiled from the kingdom. This is a political move based on Shifgrathor, basically a detailed system of formalities that Genli doesn't quite understand even with the investigation team's help. Estraven made too many mistakes while defending Genli, and so his political enemies managed to exile him. On the bright side, Estraven managed to give Genli an audience with the king, but the audience comes to nothing because the king is too mad and too stupid to care about talking to aliens on other worlds. There's also the fact that, from the Gethenian point of view, aliens are all perverts who constantly have their genitalia out and have sex all the time, and that's just way too disturbing for Karhide's court. Still, Genli is permitted to go where he pleases, so he takes advantage of the end of the planet's long winter to head east and explore the kingdom's countryside. Along the way, Genli learns about fastnesses, remote communities built in the frozen mountains that practice a religion called Handarata. To the investigators, Handarata seemed to be a creedless, formless religion, but they did still have a position called the Foreteller. Genli asks for a foretelling and watches the long ceremony, and after asking the question, will Gethen be a member of the Ecumen in five years, he gets a remarkably direct yes for an answer. The book then spends a chapter on what Estraven has been up to since his exile. He's been living on the bottom rung in Orgore which it turns out is basically a police state. As such, the people in charge of his sector know who he is, and when they talk to him about escalating tensions between the two nations, they also bring up Genli Ai. Estraven sees him as a way out of factionalism and war, and he encourages the Orgorain leaders to accept his request to cross the border. 
Sure enough, when the perspective switches back to Genli, he makes his travel request and eventually gets accepted. However, the border town he's in gets attacked in the night, forcing him to flee without his papers or passport. This gets him in trouble when he reaches the nearest communal farm. Luckily, someone realizes who he is and escorts him to Missionary, the capital of Orbury. There, he's treated with respect and reunites with Estrevan. Estrevan gives Genli a vague warning, but Genli moves forward anyway. The main problem he has is that his supporters in Orgorain want proof that he's an alien, but his landing pod is locked up in Carhide, and he refuses to bring the starship down with the rest of his crew on it until after he gets some kind of guarantee from the government. A guarantee they won't give without proof. Orgorain also keeps Genli a state secret instead of broadcasting everything about him like they did in Carhide. As such, it's easier for them to secretly arrest Genli and send him off to what's essentially a gulag. The labor camp where Genli ends up is the sort of place where people disappear, but it's not a death camp for anyone except Genli. You see, the prisoners in the camp are forced to take anti kemmer drugs to keep them focused on work, but Genli isn't from this planet and the drugs make him sick that and they keep interrogating him with truth drugs and he gets worse after every session. Fortunately, Estrevan is still looking out for Genli. Estrevan finds the labor camp where they put Genli, he fakes being a guard, and then he fakes Genli's death so that the two of them can escape. He then helps Genli recover, and the two decide to return to Carhide by crossing the glacier that borders both nations. Most of the rest of the book is a person versus nature account. No politics, no space travel, no relationship problems, just two individuals trying to cross a deadly glacier. There's just one revelation that happens during this trip. Genli realizes that Estrevan is not only a man, he's also a woman. When they finally reach Carhide, Estrevan is shot dead since he's still in exile. Fortunately, his plan still works. Orgorain has said that Genli died, so when Carhide proves them wrong, the king gets so much prestige that he agrees to let Genli call down the rest of the Ecumen Envoy. Genli's mission is a success, but it cost him someone close to him. And after spending three years on Gethin, the male and female faces of his fellow envoys look alien to him now. The Analysis you don't exactly have to read between the lines to figure out what this book is about. It's about sex and gender, plain and simple. And all the parts of the book that are about other stuff are also about how sex and gender affect them. What if there were a world with no genders? No men, no women, not even any transgenders or gender fluids. For 24 days out of every 26, nobody is male or female. And during those last two days, you're in heat, and therefore completely willing to do the deed with anyone who has the opposite genitalia. There would be no such thing as rape or sexual dominance, because, much like with many animal species, the need to breed becomes too overwhelming to ignore. Individuals can control their sexuality by taking drugs to induce Kemmer early or skip a cycle, but once you're in Kemmer, it becomes extremely hard to control your actions. But here's the thing. As Le Guin explains in one of her expository chapters, gender does exist even on Gethin. Around 3 to 4% of the population, thanks to genetic anomalies, adopt a single sex and maintain it all year round. And regardless of which sex they happen to be, regular Gethenians refer to them as perverts. Or at least that's the closest English word Genley can think of. Perverts are considered dangerous sexual beasts because they constantly produce the pheromones that trigger early chemerings and produce the opposite sex in the people they influence. You might say that Gethenian perverts have weaponized sex in a society where nobody has sex for fun, so they really have no parallel to the sexual minorities on Earth. Then there's the family unit. Like I said before, Gethin has something resembling marriage, and the humans of Gethin are certainly familiar with love and affection, but romance doesn't exist as such because sex isn't an end goal for any relationship. 
two individuals can swear Kemmering together, which means they'll always seek each other out when they enter Kemmer and only have children by each other, but this is considered exceptional, not routine. And like on Earth, Kemmering pairs can end up falling out of love and separating. Another note? Incest is significantly less of a big deal on Gethin, because the Kemmer state does not make an exception for blood-related partners. Something else that's interesting about Gethin is a sort of disconnect between parents and children. The parents are still loving and dote on their children, but they do so much more for the children they mother than for the children they father. Gethinians also tend to raise their kids more communally than the average Earth couple, partly because anybody can become a single parent, and partly because the Oedipus Electra complexes don't exist. And let me just remind you, this book was written in the 1960s. This lack of gender and sex-based psychological differences also affects other aspects of people's lives. Gethenian nations don't have nearly the kind of hierarchy that most Earth political systems have. You have the King of Carhide, of course, but the King is often ignored, even though his will is still technically law. Instead, the Kingdom has a bunch of counselors running around and vying for power by basically avoiding direct confrontations and trying to force each other into embarrassing themselves. And I should add that, while this is a traditionally feminine approach to power dynamics, it's also very cultural. The politicians of Orgorain are much more direct. That brings us to Orgorain. Carhide is a pre-nation-state monarchy, a collection of independent city-states that pay taxes to the king and keep up the news about him, but otherwise do their own thing. Orgorain is a proper nation-state, and it's ruled by a council of 33 equals. And yet, even without the sharp hierarchy you'd see on Earth, Orgorain still manages to oppress its citizens. Police checkpoints are everywhere, and it's a saying in the country that you're better off naked with your papers than clothed without them. Orgorain also has political prisoners, work camps, and oppressed minorities. The point Le Guin seems to be making here is that male aggression isn't a necessary component of an oppressive nation. The fact that we hate each other, the fact that we hurt each other and treat each other like garbage, all of that comes from somewhere deeper than our gender identities. Somewhere more essentially human. Then there's that last part of the book, the ride across the glacier. Even this part is a study on gender, because it shows us a time and a place where gender means nothing. On that glacier, every question has to be about survival. If you can pull the sledge, you pull the sledge. If you can spot glacier rifts, you'll spot glacier rifts. If you're too exhausted to move, then you sit in the sledge. Gender, sex, maybe that will have an impact on how often you do what, but only if they have a physical impact on what you can do. You cannot wield gender or sex as a weapon on a glacier. You do what you can, no matter what that is, because if you don't, you die. I believe the glacier section comes last because it strips away all the pretensions, all the politics of the assumptions. Gender is a social construct because when you are hanging on the side of a wall of ice, it doesn't matter. How you identify yourself, who you love, none of that matters on the glacier. Now, you could certainly argue that these things have everything to do with reproduction, but the thing about humans is that reproduction, sex, love, all of that is a social exercise. So why would gender not be a part of that social experience? If we can leave it behind when we need to survive, and then bring it back up when we're comfortable, why would you think that gender and gender roles are immutable? Why would you think that gender is two separate things, when all it can do is label a long list of your individual traits, traits that don't always match up to those labels? All of us are men, and all of us are women. Because while gender roles can apply in the generic, each of us has a list of traits that belong in both categories. That is what Genli Ai discovers on that glacier. Thanks for joining me again for today's book review, and I hope I'll see you next time for a story about the devil and the service industry.